Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Myth Salon. My name is Dana White, and today we are especially honored to have Dr. Jean Shinoda Bolin come to us. And largely, we have people coming to us with scripted presentations. And today we will have an unscripted presentation where she will talk among the panelists. And, and we're deeply, deeply honored, Jean, that you would come to us today. The Miss Salon began when there were several hundred thousand coronavirus cases in the United States and only a handful of deaths, hundreds. In the four months since, we are approaching now six million coronavirus cases and about 180,000 will have died in the country by this weekend. Just a tragedy. And so as we begin, I would like to have a brief moment of silence and then we'll begin. All right, and a little something that I, I want to read. The, the new moon began yesterday. Rumi tells us there's a moon inside each of us and that we should learn to be companions with it. For the next two weeks, the sky will feel the sliver of the moon becoming full. The waters inside me churn restlessly as the moon speaks its relations with the sun in the only way it knows how, reflecting grace. It has taken me a lifetime learning to be patient with the moon inside me, mindful that while I mirror the moon, neither will nor intentions change the moon or its light. Cutting myself off does no good. The moon penetrates my being. I can only affect my relations with the moon by paying attention to the moon inside me and becoming mindful of the difference. So with that, I'd like to welcome everyone into the Myth Salon today. It's a very hot day in Southern California. And I'd like to turn it over to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Will Lin. And he, Will will introduce Gene and the rest of the panel. And so with that, Will, welcome this afternoon. Thank you, Dana, and thank you for that wonderful poem. Um, you know, before, before we get started, I just wanted to share a couple announcements. Uh, you guys have been getting our, our newsletters and then we got a couple exciting things coming up. Uh, Corinne Bordeaux has uh, teamed up with us to begin a screening series that we'll do. And we've got our first event, uh, Krishnamurti Bohm and the Edges of Transcendence, based on a new documentary uh, on David Bohm uh, that will begin, um, that will be, let's see, September 23rd, and we'll share that link. And we've also got another event coming up. We're celebrating uh, with uh, Michael Weesey, we're which is the publisher. We're celebrating uh, the 25th anniversary edition of The Writer's Journey with Chris Vogler and uh, some surprise guests. So I hope you'll check out those two events. Uh, they're, they're kind of outside of our normal lanes and, and wanted to call your attention to them. We've got a number of other things coming up. And so I hope that you guys will keep your eyes open for those. Uh, a number of exciting guests we'll soon announce. Uh, and with that, I want to shift over uh, to express my gratitude uh, to Jean Shinoda Bolin for joining us tonight. Uh, Jean is a world-renowned writer and lecturer, uh, probably best known for her book, uh, The Tao of Psychology, Synchronicity in the Self, uh, but many of us also know gods in every woman and gods in every man. Uh, so thank you, Jean, for being here tonight, and, and thank you for uh, taking us into liminality, which is certainly an experience that many of us are steeped in right now. And with that, I, I want to welcome the panelists, uh, who many of us, uh, who many of you know by now. We have, uh, of course, you know, Dr. Dana White, uh, is a contributing faculty member at Pacifica, co-founder and host of this Myth Salon. 
Uh, I chair the general education department at Hushin College. Uh, and Dr. Dennis Slattery is an author, scholar, and faculty member, or former, or uh, a long standing faculty member of Pacifica Graduate Institute. Dr. Zaman Stenazai is an author, scholar, poet, uh, and faculty member at uh, Pacifica Graduate Institute. Dr. Voris Nunley, an author, scholar, and professor at the University of California, Riverside. And Dr. Selena Matthews, uh, who's an author, a clinical depth psychologist, and clinical depth psychologist. And tonight we have a special guest. Uh, oh, and Connie Zweig, uh, who's been new to our panel and have been joining us the last couple of weeks, uh, much to our uh, uh, good fortune. Uh, Connie is an international author, best known for her work on The Shadow, uh, and I hope you'll check out her books, which we'll share in the, in the text below. Uh, and with that, I'd like to welcome a special guest we have tonight, uh, Tony Dianca, who many of you know. Uh, Tony, Tony's been putting on events in the space of mythology, depth psychology, and Jungian psychology for the last 35 years. And I uh, want to take this moment to thank her for all of those events and all that she is doing and has done to support this community in this field, which is really a big part of what, what we want to do, what the Myth Salon always has been about, is supporting community and supporting this field and bringing us together. So it's a real honor and treat to have you here with us, Tony. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and with that, we're going to hand it over to Jean, and uh, then you know the normal drill. Uh, when she is, uh, after she's introduced uh, her conversation, the panelists will join, then we'll invite y'all to join with us, and we'll have a great night and wrap up around seven. Uh, and with that, thank you, and I'm looking forward to a great night. Hello, everybody. This is a, a new adventure. All during this period of pandemic, there are new opportunities and doors that open and doors that close. It's just an amazing, unusual time. And I think about uh, the, the word liminal. It's from the word threshold. It's that space where we are now between what was and what will be. So it's like the space in between two major parts of a person's life or two big rooms in which you can't go back to what was anymore. And where you are in this in-between place, how you react to it, what happens to you during it, and what happens to those you know, and what happens to your world, all of that affects us in this liminal place. And we are here until the coronavirus epidemic, pandemic is over. So we can imagine at least this whole year 2020 is the pandemic. And chances are very good that if we're waiting for a vaccine to come, it may be at least another year where we are in between what was and don't know what's going to happen next. So liminal is a personal experience as well. Uh, when I think about the word uh, crisis, because we're called, this is a pandemic crisis. Crisis in the, when in, in the Chinese pictograph is made of two, two words. Uh, two pictographs. One is opportunity and the other is danger. And certainly that describes where we all are. Every time we make a decision to go out or stay in, danger, opportunity. Will we get infected or not? It's a it's a time that we share with everybody, but mostly when we go through our own personal crisis, it's just us. And you know what it's like to go through a crisis. You no longer are able to go back to what was. A crisis is often caused by the end of a relationship, a sudden illness that changes you physically or someone that you are close to, a disaster that has happened to you financially. All kinds of crises happen, but most of them are quite personal. And again, in between what used to be when life was as usual and what happens next 
we individually have to make decisions about what we will do about this crisis that we're in. How much will we spend time mourning loss of what was? How much will we spend depressed and angry about what was? And what will we do and envision about what may come next? And the thing about liminal is that what we are doing in between shapes where we will be next. And I'm thinking about the liminality to this planet. For one thing, the pandemic seems to be an experience that humanity in general is, is feeling the impact of it. It isn't just one country or one city or one race. It seems to be something that is involving everybody. And it certainly is making, the, making us aware of the differences in classes and co competency that you can handle if it's a financial situation, if you can live comfortably through it, or whether you are jammed together with lots of other people and contagion is very much a possibility. So we are in this place, a place in which we saw the signs of, of the climate change coming and we ignored it. Global warming has been happening and we've been ignoring it. Then the pandemic hit in places like India and suddenly the skies were clear. There were people in India who are, were, saw, were seeing the Himalayas for the first time. The picture of Earth from outer space. Suddenly there were places covered with fog and smog and debris that got clear. So the beautiful blue planet that we first saw in the 60s when the astronauts went towards the moon and turned around and took a picture of what our mother to the earth and we saw her for the first time and she was beautiful. We're, we're called the blue planet and this was our mother to the earth. And it was a mandala. I mean, you take a picture and it, it's always in a square when it's a photograph and in the center of it was this beautiful blue planet with a white clouds over it and, and signs of earth underneath it. And this was home against an absolute black void of space. And it moved us a lot, we who were around in the 60s, it, because it was beautiful. It was the first time that we saw the Earth from outer space as separate from our merger with the Earth. And I, I thought at that time about how it was like a growth in consciousness for all of us who were children and we grew in age and many of us grew in maturity and some of us didn't because if you grew in maturity what you did is you started to shift from seeing your mother just as from the standpoint of what she did or didn't for you so it was all in terms of how i was well taken care of by her or how she was fine or she went crazy or whatever it was. And then as you get older, and especially as you start to see her as an older person, you begin to realize life is different. And now it begins to come into the, she isn't the all mother and she isn't that vulnerable. And that's what consciousness brought to us in the sixties and seventies. There was sort of a sense that we have a beautiful and fragile earth. And, and we, as the population has grown and as we developed and the proliferation of nuclear weapons, it was clear that we could destroy this beautiful blue home, this beautiful, our mother, the earth. And so there was a possibility of growing in consciousness as humanity. And I'm wondering if this is, you know, what is happening now? It's, it's so unclear whether we as humanity are going to grow wiser and more connected with each other or whether we're going, to, we're going to build walls and keep projecting our shadow onto the other. Are we going to feel like we are one human experience and it, it happens to be diversity? Or are we going to do the hierarchical, patriarchal thing 
of superiority, power over, and diminishing down the line uh, along economics or racial lines. So what a, an amazing place that we have been halted to be in. If it weren't for the coronavirus affecting everybody, and especially affecting more older people than younger people, and among older people, more males and females, because the XX chromosome seems to protect women more than the XY does for men. So older men have been the patriarchal figures that have pretty much run this planet. But things are, are changing. We have, we have seen authoritarianism at its worst in our own country. And Brazil has experienced it. And Russia is experiencing it. And Brazil has finally sort of stopped him from, from totally taking down the Amazonian forests um, because when you are in a hierarchical power over place, you don't realize the interdependency of us all. And might this coronavirus be raising our consciousness in ways that we could never expect without it? This is when those of us who are therapists see most of the people that come to us. There's been a crisis in their lives and they're wondering what next. And that's are they reacting to what is with the depression or the fear or the whatevers and somebody thinks that they should do they should go to therapy so we see people in this liminal place the crisis has happened and what happens do they listen to their dreams do they look back on their past uh, can they stop for a while and look inward can major change happen in which people start to, instead of carrying out what they were supposed to be, what their family said they should do, what their culture sh said they should be. You know, the Jungian business is about helping people to become the persons they were meant to be. The Jungian business called individuation really has so much to do with that. With who, what did you come into this world with? And what are you going to do with this one wild and precious life? That phrase comes to mind from um, the poem, the, the poem that, that, that reads A Summer Day. And it, the last of it says, doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what do you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Well, precious is a clear, obvious word. But wild has another meaning for, for me. Wild seems to me to be what we came into the world with before it got uh, affected by culture and family. But wild is what our natural nature was, what we came into. Wild is like a virgin forest before it's cut down. It's like our earth when it was green. We are now in this liminal time when our own journeys, which is about individuation, about what did we come to do? What did we come to, to love? What did we come to do with our one wild and precious lives when we are sharing it with humanity and this planet? And the questions have a lot to do with stopping power over hierarchy to the circle model in which like a, either a family or a nation or even humanity cares and hears from everybody and not just listens to the people at the top who speaks for everybody else so i'm 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 speaking as a well, from a number of perspectives. First of all, I'm Japanese American. I was born before, before World War II. I was born in California. When I was in kindergarten, Pearl Harbor was bombed and, and within a matter of months or so after that, any 
Japanese American born on the West Coast of the U US of A was going to be under martial law rather than civilian law. And the possibility and the expectation is that they could be taken away, we could be taken away and put in what we call concentration camps, although they were called relocation camps at the time. Now, I happen to not be incarcerated behind barbed wire because I had an activist father and a doctor mother and we got out of the state. And so I missed the experience of being with all the, the Japanese Americans of my generation because they grew up behind barbed wire. And I, I went with my activist family to different parts of the country. And as soon as the war was over, we came back to California again. Now, I have a feeling that there is an experience that individuals who end up as in this Jungian world, in, in the world in which you create Oh, well, you, 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 you listen to something from inside, not just from outside. And you make decisions that often have to do with who you really are. And that's, that can somehow get you into trouble or individuate. You get to become more and more authentic when you are forced to be often. And when you don't then fit in very well, you can't go unconscious just like that. And that's been my experience because I didn't, I didn't fit in with my generation of Japanese American kids because I didn't have that privilege of being in a concentration camp. But a war was going on with Japan and so I had to be kind of wary as I went to public schools in the rest of the country about how would I be perceived. And I have ended up been, being myself in a place which it you might even call uh, a kind of positive, um, it's not exactly liminal, it's positive marginality. When you don't fit in, but you're acceptable, then you stay conscious of the differences that there are. And it, it's a perfect background to be a commentator or a therapist where you don't go unconscious because you don't quite fit in, but you're acceptable. And I would imagine that a number of people who tune into things Jungian have had that experience. Maybe it wasn't so marked as mine. Maybe it was you were the only introvert in a very extroverted Italian family, for example, in which case you didn't quite fit in. Most, of, most people begin to make changes to become who they really are by not fitting into who they were expected to be or they were able to do that up to a certain point. If you're lucky, you can do it up to a certain point, get educated if that was the expectation, go to college, because that was the expectation, uh, go into the world, and then you run into your personal crisis, whatever that may be, a personal one, occupational one, an illness, and then the opportunity exists for you to give up, give in, or to start to really go from inside out and become connected to who you really might be and take that path. So the liminal time in which people wondered, well, are you gonna emerge from this bad divorce? You know, how are you gonna do that? Are you gonna get through this, this illness? And what are you gonna be like then? Uh, if your business collapses and suddenly you don't have that same um, you're not looked up to like you used to. You're called a failure. What next? Well, this is where humanity is. This is what liminal means. You're in between what was and you get to shape what will be. So that's my sense of where we are now in this pandemic and how it is also that I wanted to respond when I was thinking of uh, Dana, when you were talking about the moon. Well, I'm a moon sign. And as a moon sign, the introverted Cancerian moon has always fascinated me about the stages of the moon, you know, going from, from the, 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 the sliver of the moon that, that moves into the, 
the half moon and then the full moon and then it it, it goes into the third phase of of the waning moon so from waxing to full to waning to dark and that psychological experience is one in which we also go through many many different ways and the dark of the moon is kind of like a liminal space with what we're talking about now that we we aren't deeply in touch with with our moon quality if that is our major astrological sign for example and the question is it invites the moon to go in i mean the moon has always been the sign of the feminine as well our feminine quality and it's also been a sign of when you see things by moonlight it's quite different than when you see it by sunlight the sunlight bright sunlight is bright and dark light and dark good and bad it's that judgmental kind of thing moonlight sees everything by the under a mystical light and it's under a mystical light that to see experience what we are going through right now is what i would kind of suggest to think that we are in a mystical liminal time where what we are who we are and it's a mixture of inward and a, and a, and a mix of activism because i also need to speak to the reality of of this being my talking in the way I'm talking about, you wouldn't think that it's part of my activism, but it really, really is. That 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 I started. I've been an activist, objecting when to injustice and things a long, long time. I've gotten trouble. I got into trouble, and I also got. I also have grown considerably because of causing trouble and so when when most recently i got introduced um of the man who walked across the petrus bridge and, and got beaten up and almost died and how he grew to be who he is and was and i had never even appreciated him until i sat through those memorial services and how he could love and not hate and how he could keep on trusting and find there was great value in it um we are getting different heroes these days and we are in a time of potential great shift and this election coming up it is so obvious there are real choices to make and we don't know until it com comes to pass whether in spite of where we think it's going it still could be corrupted we know that too we have gotten to be more realistic about the ways things are we're living in the middle of a major story all of us and we each have a contribution to make whatever it may be so I've wandered, as I said, it's a bit unscripted. I've wandered over a number of things. And so I would kind of appreciate now hearing from anyone else comments or questions that would help me to move wherever this, this flow of heart-connected activism and individuation might take us. Thank you, Jean. Um, yeah, glad to, to ask a, a first question. And, and you've said so many things that are sticking with me. And uh, my first question is now circled back to my most recent one. And that is, uh, you said that, you know, we need different heroes. Uh, and we need we have new heroes coming through. And I'm wondering, uh, part one, if you might define some of the qualities you see as especially important right now for heroes of today. And that ties in with another question I wanted to ask, which is, if you see any gods uh, or goddesses uh, being activated in men and women right now uh, in an especially strong way that you consider uh, particularly important. That could be the whole subject of <laughs> another myth, Salon. Um, I think what is, what is happening is the coping that we watch people doing and the, the you know, the heroes that, that we are, are seeing are those in the emergency rooms, for example, those hours that they are spending 
the the realities of of people waiting in the halls and dying in the halls and i because i was a a, a medical doctor resident and well it's a i was a psychiatric resident but i was a rotating intern at la county hospital uh, and a medical student before that and to be at la county hospital and watch what was called red blankets being brought up to the floor when you were on call on the gurneys because there have been many different accidents or shootings or whatever i can just well imagine what it must be like to be on the front lines of those hospitals and what has been interesting for me to watch on television is that the great diversity that has happened among med the medical professions that are on the front line i'm really surprised to see the number of women doctors, for example, on the front lines. After the 2016 election, the number of women of diversity in the House of Representatives also was amazing. And as I watch television and watch governors and mayors speak up and see that they are not all white men at all, I'm beginning to realize that, that our country actually has been growing into a different diverse kind of phase. And, and so the heroes are those who stepped up because you change the world by just often individuating and being yourself. Every single one of those emergency room docs of a different color or, 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 or a woman rather than, than men and who are the first person in their families to ever do that sort of thing, they just did it because they were called probably to do it and they worked and and went through a, a, the medical school it, initiation is tough and you get through it and you don't think that you are doing something beyond your own life and yet when i saw all those different diversity of people on television i knew that the kids of all kinds of racial backgrounds and those girls especially were seeing oh if she could do that i could do that too. i could be this person now the one reason i'm a doctor is my mother was one of those very first women doctors so it was something that i could envision if i wanted to be a doctor i could be one after my mom was one however i didn't want to be a doctor I had wanted to be a lawyer because I had been a debater, et cetera, et cetera. And then I was absolutely humbled by my awareness in, 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 in high school where I was big cheese officer, winner of this or that or the other thing. And I went up to the mountains and I had this humbling experience. Since I was one of two kids and my younger brother was birth damaged or Anyway, from the time he was born, there was something gravely wrong with him. And so here I was in high school, about to think about going on to law school, when, and, and full of myself, when it occurred to me really strongly that my brother could have been me. That everything that I was proud of and, and, and took accomplishment times for, had to do with, I was a fortunate one in so many ways. And yes, I worked and all of that. But that humbling kind of thing about, about um, real, realizing, and it was there as a high school 17 year old that I was um, Uh, moved in prayer and in meditation and in just up in the mountains of the spirits and all that. And I ended up making a, uh, it, it had to do with learning to know how privileged I had been, how that, but, but, for, but for good fortune for me. And I had this insight in prayer that my task was to help people, you know, not to win, win debates and be <laughs> win law cases if I got into law school. So my experience was to promise God at that point that I would, that 
I would want to help people. And the next thing that came to mind, since the only model I had was to be a doctor. And I did not have the interest in science or chemistry or whatever, but a promise is a promise. And the experience of going through medical school and going through internship and first time in residency deciding I, I, it, that a year of residency in psychiatry wouldn't hurt any specialty I would go into. I had not intended to be a psychiatrist. So a series of events had happened. So I had a half filled out application, I thought, because I had not asked for any recommendations. And I was accepted by wire to UC Langley Porter in San Francisco. And I wanted to get back to San Francisco. And I figured a year of psychiatry could help me in whatever I went into. I went on to the locked wards in my first period of residency and met and had like five psychotic patients. And I could meet them. They were suicidal or they were psychotic. And I could connect with the person inside who was terrified by all the voices they were hearing and everything that was going on. And from that point on, I was on track to become what I actually ended up having a love for and a talent for. It was a, a bit of a long stretch to get me there, but there is something to be said for growing into becoming the person you were meant to be. Thank and you I for that. I, I mean, yeah, I guess, uh, yeah, if what you're saying is right, it's not, it's not some specific quality or not some particular archetype that, that really the best way we can serve, if I'm hearing you, is to be ourselves as fully as we can figure out how to be. I would say that's really true. But the, the books, The Goddesses in Every Woman and Gods in Every Man, that use the Greek uh, models, the Greek gods and goddesses as models, it's part of our educational process. So we know them, we know who's who. And when you read about them and there is an aha, there's a sense of, aha, I am like that one. And then you go more deeply into reading about who that archetype is, you, you have some sense of knowing the form of part of you that may be really important. And that's why they, because they're archetypes, they're archetypes, they're patterns. They don't actually have a name in us. But we recognize them because of the mythologies. I think there's a connection between the archetypal patterns that we live or that live through us and liminality. And I think part of what's happening in this collective liminal space where everything is so uncertain, there is no back to normal. That was, you know, six months ago. And everything is so uncertain that, and everyone is either staying home or taking risks, that those archetypal patterns have shifted in us. That, the, that part of what's so anxiety provoking is that the stories we're living have changed so dramatically. And we don't know not only what our roles will be in the new story, but we don't know more deeply, you know, who our souls will be. I mean, I, I'm not living Athena in quarantine, <laughs> right? And so my story is completely altered. And I think, and I don't know if people are articulating that to themselves or not, you know, how many people are oriented that way to articulate it, but I observe it. And so I'm wondering, um, in this great unknown, um, do you have any intuition, Jean? Because I can see how intuitive you are by the way you speak. Do you have any intuition about who will emerge and what the story will be about humanity 
on the other side of this. And I know there can be, you know, the Trump versus Biden story and all that BS, but what is the, um, will it be a monarch coming out of the chrysalis or will it be something else? It's the great unknown. That's what the thing about liminality is we actually don't know what's next. And that, that applies to culture that it, and, and humanity as a whole, but taking it down to the individual person, the, the, what was, uh, and, and the generation that should be going to college now, I mean, what's fascinating is how much the prestigious colleges are doing the same sort of thing of, of uh, they're having to watch out for the pandemic, uh, shut down, talk about having classes virtually. Um, people who, who really want to get a college education, no matter how poor they are, probably during this liminal time could go for it. That's an amazing possibility because before it got to be so much of, of, of and the cost of, of, of the colleges are, have become amazingly high. And now people are saying, well, why should I pay 70,000 a year to go to college when I have to go virtually anyway? So there's a reorganization of, of things in which one could also discover what you're really intrigued with. What do you really want to? You can go online and, and follow an interest that will take you into a world that you could never have entered before there was, there were these, these uh, devices. You can have conversations with people you've admired. A kid, a kid with a with a mind, and and a a soul and a spirit that 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 has a vision and can articulate it can can meet people can move. So I think I think that we can't know. There's something about listening to people's dreams. I mean, I I. I have a virtual practice. I find that it, that it, it, there's a lot to working virtually and there's some drawbacks, but, but there's, there's, there's more give and take and there's more, uh, get bringing objects in that the person brings with them or something from the house and shows me and things like this. So the, the opportunity to, listen to one's dreams and be reminded of of parts of our lives that really were important but remember how busy we were when we commuted and and weren't sheltering in place uh, what about those things that are coming up in dreams what do they tell you about your recollections of what when you were a child gave you the most pleasure where did you feel most at home before you got set on the path that you were supposed to live out then? And if we don't, if we don't change as humanity within a fairly short time, <clears throat> global warm, we have maybe the end, just to the end of the century, which is like nothing. Global warming, if we continue with all of the, the fossil fuels that we've been addicted to and all that, if we keep on this, by the end of this century, uh, we will have we have, will have done in this beautiful planet in so many ways. And so, one of of course, my activism concerns would be if you if you're teaching people to become who they were meant to be, then not every woman, for example, should have children whether she wants them or not. So reproductive rights. And choice, the basic idea of choice is coming up more and more. And if people exercise choice, 
and humanity does about fossil fuels, might we manage to save the planet and relate to one another and the diversity of one another versus building a wall against immigration and saying we are separate from everybody else when we're not. It's, we all ought to stick around just to see how the story turns out. Jean, I'd like to talk about a theme um, that is of great interest to me, and that is the theme of I can't breathe. And we know COVID is a respiratory condition. Then we have the protests, George Floyd, breathe. And then I'm realizing people are saying to me, I can't breathe when I'm wearing my mask. And I'm like, okay, that's the third piece in this puzzle. We can't breathe. And so there's definitely a disconnection to the divine, um, you, know, on, you know, on a cultural level, big time, which allows for the shadow to emerge. And of course, there's a delusional shadow right now in our culture, um, you know, QAnon and all the other conspiracy mm -hmm. theories mm -hmm. that are flooding, um, flooding our, our news waves right now. And I was reading the New York Times uh, yesterday and the article said that Facebook said in the last six months, there have been 200 to 300% increase in QAnon participants, which I found shocking. So the question I want to ask you is going to be loaded. <laughs> so I, I, I really <laughs> is right now. Um, and that is, what is fueling this delusion? Is it culture? Is it the person's, you know, personality dysfunction? Is it fear? Or is it the consequence of having a malignant narcissist at the helm of our country? So there you go. I have all of all the above. Like answer. <laughs> Something of all of the above. I'm mean, really, I, I'm, I'm thinking about how in this liminal time, nobody is feeling totally comfortable and confident. The whole order has no longer sustains people. You can't feel like just because you are the president of this or the president of that, or you live in this neighborhood or you, whatever. You can no longer feel secure in a way that you did before when you were more unconscious. So the best way to feel uh, secure is to be delusional if you are a narcissist uh, and to also have an enemy so that there's, there's the other. So you get to put all the shadow, project the shadow on the enemy. And if you have this secret society that, ha that knows the truth, then you have power. And it's all delusional, but it does help sustain uh, in this liminal time. There are some people who need to be sustained by delusions to get through this liminal time, apparently. Yeah. And they are doing that exactly. So that's, that must be part of it. The I can't breathe, though, is the, this whole planet is getting to a bit where we can't breathe. Our air is getting so contaminated that I think that, that to, to take on, to, to say, and look at California now, uh, the, the wildfire, the, 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 fi you know, the fires, the smoke, the fact that with global warming that we're not getting enough rain and, and pine trees get inflammable and et cetera, et cetera. So, so the air we breathe is getting harder and harder to breathe in. And so, and without, without reproductive choice, without women having the, the right to bear children if they want to have children and to space children if they're maternal and to give and help and enjoy having children and watching them grow up, but no, just, reproduce, reproduce, reproduce. And, and the combination of the necessity for, for uh, saving the planet, having air, uh, taking care of the people who do here, are here, it, it, it's a mix of, of, of seeing ourselves not as, as part of the circle of life, actually. 
the the model in which I became a kind of a quiet activist had to do with writing the book The Million Circle. And The Million Circle is a metaphoric number. It is the number that when formed uh, tilts, tilts culture from patriarchy into equality, because that's the, the necessity of circle. You could have a balance between male and female, between, between circle and hierarchy, but hierarchy would then be a hierarchy of of quality of, of, of you know, we, we do, do need hierarchies where it's about who makes the decision based on science or who makes it, you know, you, you want to get operated on, you don't want to go into the operating room and have everybody equal so that anybody could do the surgery. You do have to, to you do have to have an, a respect for a hierarchy of skill and education and things. But a hierarchy of just power over because you inherited it or because you uh, say you deserve it and therefore are superior to anybody else because you have the power to push everybody down, that is not, that they have circle and a hierarchy of quality and a circle of connection. Uh, what Zoom is doing is maybe helping this to happen because the Zoom families uh, you could have been in a family where only one parent always dominated the conversation. You go on Zoom, and when it's anybody's time to talk, they usually all can talk. And the idea of the minute circle had to do with, with um, one of them was three to the 19th power. He had three people who formed a circle, and they formed, they went out, and each of them formed another circle, and threes, and threes, and threes, and 19 steps, you'd have over a billion circles in the world. Um, so that when real change happens, it happens from the grassroots up. And, and like having understood that the women's movement of the late 70s, of the late 60s and 70s began with just women talking. They were called cautious race raising groups. Ah, you know, just women talk, you know, they talk all the time. But they empowered each other. So the difference between the late 60s and the 70s is was the decade of the women's movement changed the American culture considerably. And now, well, this is what I'm seeing when I look on television and see the doctors, there's diversities, there are men and women of different cultural and racial backgrounds, which um, happens because of the equalitarian element in the 70s that, for example, uh, changed a lot of the laws that had to do with, with entering colleges and things like that. So it's, you don't see what's really happening right away. But during this liminal time, the hope is that a lot of good is happening. And one of them is that whether with all the casualties, we are at least temporarily experiencing stopping global warming for a little bit. Yeah. Jean, mm -hmm. this is Dennis. Um, thank you for your wonderful insights and for your storytelling, for telling us uh, parts of your story that I know that I didn't know about. And <laughs> It leads me to just make an observation, I think. I'm not, I'm not sure if a question is going to come out of this, and, and that's OK, too. But it feels like when we tell our stories, we are put in a liminal space. And um, the way that I want to think about it is that <clears throat> that liminal space is a place between recovering something in memory and discovering something mm. at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about stories, but now I'm, I'm wanting to stretch that out a little bit and think um, that, you know, for example, whenever, whenever we're reading um, or whenever we're writing, it invites, it feels like a liminal place so that 
you know, and I just, I, I marvel at you and your ability to speak extemporaneously. That just scares the bejesus out of me. Uh, I need a script, and then I'm happy to riff off it because I have my security blanket, you know, to return to. But when I'm, and maybe this would be a good place for you to uh, comment, when you're, you know, you have this wealth of knowledge, but as you speak, and as you speak, it's not a but, um, something is organizing it, something, you know, to move to the next thing. And what it has, listening to you, what it has done to me, and I don't think I'm alone, it's put me in a liminal place because I'm recalling moments of my childhood when I was seven and eight. So just listening to you feels very liminal to me. And uh, anyhow, any observations uh, from you on that, I would really appreciate. You know, I feel the same way you do about reading often, that I step into the, I step, I, it, it becomes very real to me that, that uh, so that sometimes when I've, I've, I've read a very meaningful, and it's fiction that moves me much more than nonfiction ever got, did, uh, to then see a movie made out of it, and it's not that, you know, it doesn't fit. When I was reading the book, I had a wholly different idea of what the hero of the story was going to be and that sort of thing. Because when I was reading the words, I was also in a space where my imagination uh, followed the characters and they became part of my experience, not the words on pages, that's for sure. So I appreciated what you said about that being a liminal thing. The other thing about when people come into therapy during a liminal time in their lives because something major has changed and they're anxious or they're depressed and they don't know what's going to come next. So yeah. they either go into therapy voluntarily or someone suggested or whatever. Then you said the words ex recover and explore, recover and find. Yeah. Uh, that is what happens in the, the, the analytic session. Mm. Who association mm. to dreams because what we've asked of the person is the whole person so that the dream side starts to comment because the person will remember a dream and it happened that the scene took place with people from the past there is a recovery reconnection with that yes. only now there are adults looking at it and discovering often what was meaningful to them then yeah. before they got caught up in all of the stuff that they were supposed to get caught up. Yeah. Uh, and, and so there's something of that, that uh, liminal, the, the analytic session uh, where, where is a liminal space too. You yes. come in so many ways it is a liminal space. They yeah. step actually, now it's virtually, but usually they step across the threshold into our office for a certain period of time, for my sessions are 50 minutes, they could talk about anything. But there's also a knowledge that, that I might have a special interest in a meaningful dream. And then it's, it's like a discovering what the dream might be saying. But it's, that, it's the person's dream. It's some part of them that up until they understood that they have a dreaming psyche, it was a mysterious part of themselves that they didn't know very much about. And now they find that there's a kind of a, it talks in a different language. It talks in metaphor, it talks in fragments, but oh my goodness, it is reminding me of something terribly important. Yes. And that's a discovery. Yes. Thank you, Jean, very much. That was beautiful. Jean, one of the things that I felt when you were talking about the planet Earth from outer space was how our world and everything in it is interconnected. And that we 
in the particularly North America are, are, are quite privileged by distance. And so the reality is that we have not suffered invasions that have characterized almost every culture in, in, on the planet. And other than being the invaders to invade America as our, when we founded America, this is, this coronavirus is really the first assault we've had on our culture. And that it, it, we're unprepared to know how to deal with it. And cultures can be described as being loose or tight, but cultures that have had to deal with invasions in the past have developed response mechanisms within their cultures such that when a situation happens, they respond either immediately or quickly. And so when there are situations where they need to lock down, they can lock down. And that doesn't, isn't something that has responded to us in America in a very friendly sort of way. So our loose culture has given us this ability to feel like, well, nobody's gonna tell me what to do. I mean, I mean, and so we go without masks or we don't follow all of the practices that these other countries throughout the world have bought into. And as a result, throughout the world, every culture in the world except for the United States has really seen the coronavirus being curtailed and almost eliminated. Mm -hmm. And it, it is our inability to really perceive interconnectedness or our natural sense of being involved in one another's lives that has really, we're paying a high, a high price for that right now. Um, is there any part of that that you could respond to? Well, it's clear to me that it, the reason that we have failed and the other countries have succeeded, especially the democratic countries, such as Germany and uh, countries that have been, ha has had to do with the leadership, that there has been an encouragement of, you can't tell me to do anything from the top. And it has made a considerable difference. It has brought about well, I don't know, you know, I, I'm politically, obviously, not in Trump's corner. But I can, I can see the mess he is making, humbling, humbling this country. When, when other countries pity us, because they, they should pity us, we are making such a mess of dealing with the coronavirus. And not only do we have more casualties than anybody, but the more, it, it, the more we keep on doing what we are doing, which is to not uniformly say we all wear masks in order to protect other people as well as ourselves. The whole thing about masks and cultures are being used because we are interconnected. Instead, we have a lot of people in this country that follow the Trump model. I mean, when the leaders of the country don't provide leadership with meaning, we have what we have. And so it must be a sort of a shadow that, that this country has, has sort of, I mean, because there's always been this sort of, of, of the, the idealizing the cowboy the lone uh, hero, uh, the, 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 the rebel without a cause, the various, I mean, we've, it's been an interesting culture that, that uh, hasn't felt much interconnection. On the other hand, because of the, the, that, but the individual style of it has allowed for a lot of individual growth too. I mean, so, but but right now, uh, the 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 I'm I'm wondering about uh, my by the way my my college uh, back in the day when I thought I should be a doctor, I did take the courses that were required as an undergraduate, but I stayed with the courses that I truly loved. So I was a history major. 
and that idea of seeing historically looking back at how the 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 countries that held power over other countries fell one after another well we could fought you know it would be it would be a shame for the us of a to fail it would be good if it if this country got truly humbled and aware that it isn't superior to everybody else but it is part of the global humanity and that we're all in this together and we couldn't get that we couldn't get there but for the mess that Trump has made of our country and, and the casualties, where uh, we look at the other countries and they are looking after their people so much better than we are. It probably is good for this country to, to, to value the kinds of things that had to do with uh, the Statue of Liberty. There, there really is a the difference between put the walls up and the Statue of Liberty. There's such a difference between uh, the, the financial way that wealth is distributed and a country that could be both caretaking of its people and also allow for innovation and capitalism. I mean, we could do better. And, and so in our this liminal time for for Americans uh, and Americans who run this country because they get elected to run it, to to get into a place of of uh, the positive sides of the American vision, because there truly has been one. I I am uh, remembering that back in high school, I was one of four of the. Um, graduation speakers and we used the four lines from the Statue of Liberty for the topics of our talks and as you know give me your tired your poor your teeming masses yearning to breathe free I lift my lamp beside the golden door and the golden door was a door of opportunity where, where you could come into this country from whoever you were back in the old country where you were in a caste system or you were in a class system, you would come to this country and you could work hard and you would care for your children and you could make them American citizens born here and pretty soon you could, you could make your story happen in the world. It wasn't that other people determined who you were going to be. So the golden door was just that. So we have the golden door, which the Statue of Liberty stands for, and we have the uh, fences that Trump is building along our southern border and metaphorically is building in general to keep any diversity out. So, you know, Jungians love the idea of the, the tension of opposites, that when you are between the tensions of opposites, might there be something that emerges different than either the either or of each each one you know it's sort of like maybe we will come up with something mm, if i can jump in um i think that in a way if you look at it in the longer historical context we are probably at a point of a what a hegemonic shift and the way it has happened in the past is that whichever country, whichever power uh, was considered the hegemon, the second, the third, the fourth uh, ranking countries would kind of gang up on them and they usually uh, resorted to uh, military wars and all that stuff. Uh, but I have a feeling like the way it's happening here is that, uh, that I, I think the number two and number three uh, Russia and China are trying to work from within um, and that they are in a way ruining our s system and the reason they are interfering they have interfered and then they will interfere again is that they would like for America to humble itself from within and that way 
uh, they can shorten the distance between uh, where the United States is in, in world politics and, and how closely they could catch up with that. And I, th I don't know why people are not even considering this element of the conflict of interest that the Russians did interfere. Mm -hmm. And if they interfere, they interfered to benefit Trump. So why would Trump explore that possibility to reveal that? Because then he would be proving his, be his own being uh, an illegitimate or uh, uh, an illegitimate president. So he wouldn't do it. And when I look at the foreign policies or the foreign policy initiatives, in a way, uh, he is so beholden to the Russians that everything he does in foreign policy, first and foremost, helps Russia. He sure does. Whether it's the Ukraine, mm -hmm. or whether it's the trade with the China, or with any other country, the primary beneficiary is Russia. So why wouldn't Russia, why wouldn't Russia interfere again? Because it, it will, one, it will benefit from the policy that's going on, and the second, the United States will be sinking down as, as Russia gains, uh, you know, uh, that's the thing. But when, um, to shift a little bit more to the concept of the liminal, uh, the opportunity and the danger element part of it is, um, then if we look at the longer, uh, in the long span the, the, of human history, all that has happened in the last, uh, well, uh, uh, 1500 to 2000 years is that we have shifted from God to gold and nothing has changed. And the system we have now is um, uh, uh, the, the, the driving force of it is greed. Yes, you can call it capitalism, you can call it profit, you can call it bottom line, but it is greed driven. So if it is greed driven, why should we expect that the gap between the rich and the poor should, uh, should be eliminated. It keeps expanding. And so I don't know if um, this uh, COVID opportunity, if this is that liminal moment that would take us away from this God gold uh, paradigm to uh, some other way where the value would be important rather the commodifi commodification of things. And as you pointed to a few things earlier, you say, yeah, it's good in the United States. I see a whole lot of diversity. Um, I uh, think that the real diversity we need is not there yet. We might have a diversity in terms of racial, cultural, gender, yes, but um, they are not, uh, um, and I wouldn't say that they are not allowed, but they are still playing the game of a dominant culture where if we have, say, an Indian, a Chinese, a Japanese, and a Latin American, an African who is getting into the system, they have to so fully assimilate culturally that on the surface we may see the diversity, but in reality they are working for the same system of greed. I'm thinking that uh, perhaps the real diversity would be if we incorporate values of other culture systems where we can learn from them. And yes, every culture has its own protective shield. Uh, I'm sure everyone knows how long it took for us to overcome the resistance of using uh, Chinese, uh, what is it, uh, uh, acupuncture and certain other techniques that people used to laugh off, like, I mean, how is that even supposed to work? Uh, because we were so dismissive, because it was from another culture. And yet it's now becoming part and parcel of our, at least this medical field. Um, so I'm thinking that even in, in the economic sense, um, look at the uh, experiment in Bangladesh, uh, with the uh, with the micro manage uh, micro banking, where they start giving loans uh, in the amount of fifty dollars to the poorest of every village, in other words, to lift up from the bottom. Uh, and Bangladesh is certainly one of the poorest countries in the world. Whereas here, when you look at our tax brackets, most of the money goes to the top. In other words, 
Um, I, I think whether it's in economics and politics and uh, God forbid in matters of religion and other issues, I think we need a real diversity. Um, well, we with, with, uh, a, a diversity where we will really become a global culture, rather a one dominant culture that has dominated the world. And I'm not saying that the Western culture is bad. As good as it is, I think it could still benefit from certain values from, say, a Japanese culture or certain values from uh, the Aborigines of uh, Australia and things like which, which uh, of which we are pretty much dismissive. So our diversity is still a Western culture with a diversity in, in looks and in faces and, let's say, uh, in ethnic identities, but not necessarily in the value system. That's true. It's a start. It is a start. And the, the other thing is that what I emphasize, would emphasize more or add to what you've said is it has to do with, the, and, and it has to do with me being a feminist in spirit and, and, and all, that, that, that men's brains and women's brains are different. There are more fibers that connect the woman's brain between the two hemispheres and men there is a more sense of nurturing that is inherent in more women than men. Some of it is cultural, but some of it is probably just built in. And so if it were possible for cultures to have women who could be themselves and the nurturing ones and ones who help, want to have children could do it, and the women would do a better job of looking after the children of all children, I think. Their, their, the greed side and the uh, power side come so much from men in power and as equality in, in, in capitalism builds up, it's getting to be some women in power too, that, that basically have the problem of needing to dominate either with money, power over power, or money over. And the greed comes from there's never enough because that inside that grown person is the child who never was loved enough. And the, the spirit in the man who knows he's going to die. So between the two of them, the deprived child and an awareness of death being in inevitable, you just hide from the fear of death and hide your own really down deep. You feel like a little kid who wasn't loved enough, but maybe if I had more power, I could dominate people, or if I had more. I mean, so we, the, the system we have seems to encourage a class of people who who are, are putting money or greed as the sole reason for, for having status in this world. And what a mistake that is. I mean, if we could in any way encourage education for, for well, even that whole, whole thing about looking after children who are born well taken care of nutritionally and uh, if we had a more, if we had a culture that was not so patriarchal in attitude, I, I think, I'm, I am sure that children would be better taken care of. And as soon as children are better taken care of, I think as they grow older that they could easily start to outnumber. Um, I mean, it's about, um, it isn't about greed and gold, it's essentially down to sort of basic thing like love. I mean, one of the basic things about love is love is the love is the only sort of commodity that the more you have and give away, the more there is. <laughs> Anything else, if I give you my power, I give you my money, I have less and you have more, is usually how it works. But if, if I'm filled with love and I give you love, then you have the more and I have more and more is happening in the culture. And a country that would be more based on relatedness and compassion. And that was the basic spirit that, that, un, that, that 
came through most of the world's religions before they got corrupted. And certainly uh, Christianity has gotten corrupted from its original attitude. And, and it's also so much more psychologically healthy to be, be motivated by love and connection than the uncertainty of power and, and all of that. So if we were to change, if we were to deserve this beautiful blue planet, uh, and we have the free will as humans do, maybe, to develop into the people, you know, I keep, I keep emphasizing that the, 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 the point of like individuation in analysis is to help the person become who they were meant to be. If we could have a culture in which human beings could grow into who we could be, who we were meant to be, developing both sides of the brain, right and left, having lots of fibers between them, allowing for individuation. Uh, I wonder if we can do it before we use up this planet because we certainly have the possibility of doing it because we are this only species that, I mean, we happen to be of different races and all of that, but basically we haven't split into different species. We are of one species as human being species business. And, and we have this, this planet and we have a limited amount of time. The hope would be that this, uh, maybe we're part of, you know, the, 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 the idea that there's a certain amount of free will that we seem to have. Uh, maybe we were, are allowed, built into us, uh, the capacity to make a total mess of what, who we are and what we could do in this planet or we can evolve in a way that makes everybody who, I mean, I don't, I don't know people, people who are in power are in denial about what they feel underneath the power, I think. The fear of not being loved, the fear about if I'm vulnerable and poor, nobody will love me or, and, or they take it anyway. I mean, it, it's, um, Sometimes it seems like a too big of an, an impossible a situation to change. And then you start thinking about each person helping change the world around them and how that ripples out. And the whole notion of how change comes about because I think the, 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 the consciousness raising uh, movement affected me a lot in seeing what was possible when well-meaning uh, women shared their experiences, let down their personas, and made an effort to make this world a better place for other women as well, and made it possible for the next generations of women to enter those professional schools that women were excluded from, and then watching them on, uh, in the emergency rooms and in, in the, the corridors of power because they are, they're now women there. Now, what if we got more of a balance between men and women? Might something shift rapidly? Because shift can happen rapidly. That's one of the things about critical mass tipping point, is you don't see it happening until it just reaches just before it happens, and then it happens. And, and that's a whole notion beside, behind, behind the idea of the man's circle, that circles keep proliferating, it seems like, you know, just women doing whatever women do. But more and more men are talking to each other uh, about feelings. More and more times are hard and you can't keep up the facade anymore. And so people become real with one another. And there's something nourishing about people becoming real with one another and then being with one another to struggle through something together. That doesn't seem so far-fetched to me that it, that this couldn't be happening. And it is a kind of result of the mess that Trump made at the top. Uh, 
I think that there is a, a, a still a problem with even with that, that again, on the surface, we see that there is seemingly a lot of equality between men and women, but it's in, in most cases, it's when women are playing the men's game. So they're actually uh, men in women's body. In other words, the, the feminine values have not been accepted or introduced uh, in a more competitive sense. And, and so on, on the surface of it, we do have uh, oftentimes women prime ministers, women presidents, but they are more aggressive. They're more involved in more aggressions and wars than men are because they have to prove because they still play on the standard that, that men have defined. Well, look at Merkel. Look at Merkel and if Germany. What a... I, I wish there were more like Merkel, but there are many more like Thatcher and Dura Gandhi and the others. Well, they were the past, though. Um, well, let's, make, let's make a more subtle distinction, a more nuanced distinction, because we're Jungians here. And I think it's, it, at least for me, Jean, it's more accurate to talk about patriarchal ego which can be in men and women. Oh, yes. And moving, moving beyond patriarchal ego rather than discussion about gender. Right. Jean, this is Tony, and um, I don't have a question, but I have some comments that I want to share. When the coronavirus first came, uh, sort of became a reality, my, um, the first thing I asked myself was, what's the deeper meaning of this time? and what's being asked of us. Yeah. Um, I, all good unions are going to drop down into that, right? So I started looking at my own situation, how it was affecting me, reflecting, journaling, active imagination, all the things I would do to explore. Mm -hmm. um, but I also reached out to listen to uh, several people, but I'm going to mention two that really, um, that I have the utmost respect for and who really gave me some, um, some, something to really think about that made sense to me. Um, the first one is R Richard Tarnas. Probably mm -hmm. a lot of people know Richard Tarnas, professor, author, archetypal astrology. Um, he teaches at CIS and there's a, he did a lecture on this topic, so you can go and listen to that. But he was coming at it from archetypal astrology and uh, talking about the Saturn-Pluto-Jupiter conjunction. Um, basically, he was making the point that this is a profound period of transformation. Um, it's a time, I'm going to read this because it's just so such a powerful sentence that he spoke. It's a time in which there are volcanically intense evolutionary pressures for the radical reconfiguration of all life structures. Um, uh, he said, we're all involved in a larger zeitgeist. Um, we as a species, planet, civilization are going through a profound rite of passage, mm -hmm. um, an initiatory transformation that no one is outside of. We're in the crucible right now. We're all in it together. Um, and then he went on to say there's a profound sense of uncertainty that always accompanies any transformation on this scale and that we're being asked to meet this moment it's our time to rise to the occasion, bringing all that we've learned through the decades. Um, so not surprisingly, astoundingly, but not surprisingly, the other person that I listened to was Michael Mead. And um, that's not astounding, but he, he was pretty much saying the same thing, but coming from his, you know, he's a mythologist and a storyteller. So he was coming from um, an archetypal perspective uh, as well, but, from a different, um, different take. And he said, we're in the middle of a collective transformation, a collective rite of passage. Mm -hmm. um, he went into great detail on the three stages of initiation, separation, liminality, return. And, you know, here we are in our liminality, the not knowing. And he called it a transformative opportunity. That just really struck me. I mean, that's kind of what Rick is saying as well. And I could go on and on, but um, Michael said one more thing that, that really struck me. He said, let go of the banks of the river and go with the flow. <laughs> you know, and just encouraged us to just 
drop down, just drop down, go with it, go in it, see what it is for each of us individually. Um, and of course then collectively, but I just found what they had to say about it. Um, so brilliant. And it gave, you know, it lifted me out of my little, um, you know, four walls here of my microcosm and my own situation and gave me a greater perspective that, um, that that was just so utterly helpful. So I, I just can't help but look at what we're going through from those perspectives now, this initiatory um, and transformative opportunity. What an opportunity for all of us if we, if we can go there. I think that it truly is fitting for us all to say, appreciate Tarnas's view about what the stars are, what, what the planets are saying about where we are. It always, it, it's always served as a kind of at least general weather report so that we have a sense that we are undergoing what the astrological weather tells us we are in. And we look around and feel it out and say, well, it certainly does describe where we are. And it does. I mean, there's a, we are in a transformation or a descent time. And, you know, we, we clearly, in liminal being exactly that, that when things change, it is an opportunity and a danger that we could go into a better space, more real, more authentic, more meaningful, or we could go into shadow and go dark in so many different ways. Individually, we know that to be true. And what, what Tarnas and Mead has done has put it into a much bigger picture than the individual. Um, and, and I think it's, it's use, useful and helpful to think about your own personal liminal times and, and the potential of not knowing what you're going to do next. And what do you draw upon when you are in that in that liminal time and you don't know what's going to happen next. And what you go to, towards in yourself and to resources outside yourself makes all the difference about getting through this liminal time to what is next. And that's what we all do in our work is that we meet people when they are in a liminal experience and we are trying to help them to listen to inside and outside and the past to recover and the current to discover what has not yet had an opportunity to be lived out, but truly is this place in ourselves that would be the new place for us to grow into. So, you know, to look at the liminality of humanity and the planet with the same uh, general attitude as a Jungian working with individuals to have an optimism about growth being a natural part of the psyche of individuals and the psyche of humanity, which is how I see it. And yes, shadow, and yes, bad things happen and all, and there's also the unknown that always has to be taken into consideration. But thank you for bringing in the bigger picture because it truly, we are so much a part of this bigger picture. And thank you for joining our bigger picture tonight, Tony. Oh, I'm happy to, thank you. Jane, I'm wondering um, how we could connect the pandemic uh, and liminality to the feminine because <laughs> there are these moves that folks are making towards larger explanations. But in my view, these, and in my view, these larger explanations are centered around the feminine. So for ex feminine tropes of the feminine, for example, transformation, the trope of wildness has been brought up a couple of times, right? And if we think about, for example, in India, there they have these goddesses of contagions. They're never male, they're always female. And these goddesses of contagions, they demand that we both engage in a feminism that is and a feminine that is both emergent and requires our descent right into both the underground and the underworld so this is not a feminine of of nurturing this is a more rhizomatic feminine that requires a rethinking that requires a reevaluation 
uh, for a particular kind of change. Uh, uh, so when Zaman, I think rightfully refers to the hegemony of, 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 of uh, capital, right, which many people understand as neoliberalism uh, to wit, it's easier in America to say that one does not believe in God than it is to say that one does not believe in profit. And then I'm thinking about uh, your, your uh, familiar circle and how it asserts balance. So couldn't all this be kind of understood in another way in terms of the emergence of, of what Young referred to and I am as the feminine, as the dark feminine that requires that we cannot be the same, but we have to be different. Um, uh, and your work and, and what you've been doing today seems to, uh, to, to, come, to take us back to that, away from the hegemonic male metaphysics to a more challenging kind of feminine, dark feminine metaphysics, if that makes sense. It does make sense. And it, it made me um, think about what it's like to be a woman in labor about to give birth. <laughs> it really did. <laughs> Little. <laughs> One of my areas of expertise, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> because we are, because the transition, the transition in labor is you can't stop it really. Uh, the 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 change wants to be happen. The fetus is ready to come out, and is the. And the danger and opportunity of that is enormous because the baby must come out under the, the uh, prudential bone of the mother where if it is hung up, the baby and the mother could die without modern obstetrics. So, and, and the woman who is bearing, has been pregnant for eight or nine months and has not felt herself. She's been taken over in a sense, much as an idea takes over the mind. When a woman becomes pregnant with a baby, the baby takes over her body. And as it comes ready to come through her and out, she does not know what the baby's going to be like or what kind of a mother she's going to be like. She doesn't know whether she's going to survive the actual pregnancy delivery in a third world country where there isn't modern medicine. The baby will come out one way or another, alive or dead, as was she. And so I think about, I mean, I've seen these images of, of, of um, the planet uh, as being like the big abdomen of, of the feminine <laughs> somebody's drawing. And, and how it is that, that the transition, and, and we call transition in the living babies when it is moving out mm -hmm. of the mother into the world. Mm -hmm. And that's when the question is, will this be new life? Will it survive? And what if, what if I mean, you, you suggested to me with your question, what if we look at this liminal time as exactly that? Mm -hmm. That... Uh, Really, because that it, it because it's so true. We could evolve into a new, a newer uh, humanity, uh, or we can global warming and the use of nuclear weapons and the use of ego over, et cetera, et cetera, could pretty much obliterate this beautiful planet, and maybe it will, but maybe it won't. Maybe it will have a lot more to do with people who are more conscious about interdependency, about the feminine in men and women, because that has become more possible for men. I mean, with the, with the women's movement of the 60s and 70s, it's possible for a, a woman to step into her male part, you can cause it the animus. And the animus differ, is differentiated, by the way, by my work in, in Goddesses and Every Woman. Like Athena is being, a woman is being herself. She's not being an animus. It's just that that happens to be a strong, that her, her, one of her strongest archetypes, that's mm -hmm. all. And a man could have Demeter as an attitude of the feminine and be an extraordinarily nurturing parent. 
I mean, so the masculine and feminine in individuals is being allowed to be more than it ever has been in human being as people. Well, it the, in the diversity department, it seems to be doing a better job of that too. Amazing that uh, that gay lives became honored in a short period of time. Who would have thought it? And now, so there's something I I find that there's a, there there is definitely danger and opportunity in this liminal time that we're mm -hmm. in. And I hope we are delivering something new and wonderful at the end of this this labor and and um, danger. We have no idea for sure. You know, we've been talking a lot about love and power. And uh, I just wanted to call out, and we've also been talking about these, the, the gods and, and within. So I just wanted to call out a particular archetypal dichotomy between a god and a titan, especially uh, the, the god Zeus and the titan Prometheus. Uh, Zeus uh, very much stands for, for power, hierarchy, oppression, um, whereas uh, Prometheus stands for equality, love, uh, and the defeat of that oppressive power. And so, I don't know, I just think that uh, we've talked about uh, these different archetypes within us, and those are two strong male archetypes within all of us. And our culture seems to have, you know, our, our myth, the American myth, is the rebel versus the tyrant. Whether it's, you know, against the English monarchy or it's uh, the Civil War, it's always rebel versus tyrant. That's our ongoing myth. And the real fear, I think, that we all have, uh, whether we, we realize it or not, is that we may be shifting our myth from identifying with the rebel to identifying with the Zeus. And I think that's, you know, anyway, I just wanted to share that, that particular archetypal dichotomy while I had a moment, because uh, it's really been speaking to me during your talk. Thank you. I think of that, you know, the, in the, using the Olympians, you have the father archetype and then the, the generation of the sons, like Hermes, for example, uh, the great, the communicator, the traveler, um, Ares, uh, who, in some ways, had to go through being being rejected, um, and was a lover. <laughs> the, 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 the uh, finding that there are within the 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 classical divinities of, of Greek mythology that there are personality patterns, and finding oneself in them, and finding that there are male and female ones in 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 a psych. Like um, I have a lot of, I have a lot of Hermes. I would not be talking. There isn't a single female goddess who is good at traveling around with ideas and you know going through different levels and all that sort of thing, because Hermes has always been a strong male archetype in me. But it isn't. It, but I don't identify with it as strongly as I do with Artemis, who is the primary. Uh, like to go into the wilderness off a of beaten path, uh, kind of um, uh, mystical natures person, uh, you know, feeling the power of the moon, <laughs> various things I brought up earlier. <laughs> so you you kind of look for uh, what what it's helpful to see that that there are patterns and that every pattern has a shadow. Except except what Hestia. The goddess of the hearth and temple had no shadow. She didn't have a persona. She was the fire at the center of a round hearth in the home and in the temple. And so if you could imagine around the, the roundness with a sacred fire that, that back in the day before electricity, it not only was the source of warmth in the house, but what you used to cook with back way back when. And in the temple, the statues would be cold and dark if you didn't have Hestia's fire lighting up the temple and and reflecting off the shadow the shadows of of the the marble you know marble statues and what have you. So Hestia represents like a feminine version picture wise of the self, the center of the personality that that is is not attached to power or ego or lovers or anything. It has much to do with, with, with carrying a, a basic uh, illumination and warmth and a centeredness that's, that's nice to have. And, and uh, 
uh, men and women can carry a lot of history. A man who, who can live by himself and make a real, have a real sense of, of a house that reflects him has evoked Hestia. Uh, somebody who, who, who does it, who, who creates a temple of worship or something and, and, and lays it out so that other people can come into that space and be awed. I mean, that's a Hestian energy. They, the male and female archetypes, when I wrote, when I wrote Gods and Every Man, I said, I should have written a book that was twice as fat called Gods and Goddesses and Everyone. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. I think that without going to anyone else, we really are up against the last minute or two. Um, and I had one thing that I, you know, when I opened the Myth Salon tonight and I was talking about the moon. And the thing that occurs to me, echoing the archetypal astrology of Rictarnus, is that the ancient cultures that were at the foundation of humanity understood the natural world. And they had these relationships with the natural world such that the skies, the earth, the heavens, the waters, they, they produce their gods in relation to the natural world. And as we moved into civilizations, those relationships began to atrophy. And virtually all that's left today is the relationship with the moon. And people like Rick Tarnas can talk about archetypal astrology. And, you know, there are wise people running around in our culture able to evoke these ancient sensibilities. I can tell you for one, I feel the moon. And those who know me know I feel the moon. And it, it is easier, I suppose, to feel the moon than it is to feel the planets. Uh, Thomas More mo wrote a wonderful book called The Planets Within. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the us being inhabited by these archetypal forces. Um, of course, James Hillman talks about that. And these, you have to develop a sensory mechanism for understanding what those archetypal forces are and to recognize them when they're happening and to not be at the effect of them, nor, you know, inhabit them such that you see it as a coming from you. Because these, these forces really are alive in the world that we inhabit. And I think this is what's happening now with us, with this coronavirus, is, is compelling us to look outside of humanity for its references. That we should look to the sky, we should look to history, we should look to one another and understand that there, there are energies that if we tap into them, we can transform ourselves and live in relation to the natural world once again. The coronavirus is just simply part of that. It is telling us that, you know, you're living out of balance. Uh, the Native Americans talked about it as Koyana Scotsi. And we, we really have a life out of balance. And I think everything that you're talking about right now is putting a lens in this condition of liminality on the out, out of sorts relationships that we are having. So I want to thank you, Jean. And, you know, this has been a fabulous Miss Salon. And I, I, I would want to put it back to you one last time and let you say something that, you know, sort of puts a, a nice cap on this for us. Well, <clears throat> I'm thinking about what you just said. I'm thinking about the deprivation we have because of the overpopulation that we've had. And that has been a patriarchal kind of a thing with when women have not reproductive rights and have not been able to care properly for their kids. And men have not been allowed to, to really enter into nurturing, helping uh, their children to grow. And so, so there's been something about the missing family bonds that has created a culture of narcissism and a lot of other competitiveness and whatever. 
So there's that, but I was thinking that, that, that the, the major message for now is, is, has something to do with there are too many people and not enough trees. And we could balance it by the efforts to plant trees that breathe in the oxygen, take away our carbon dioxide, because the major awe that we have as human beings, I think, is what you said. It has to do with being awe of what it's like to be really close to nature. And how can anybody see like the Milky Way when they live under a polluted city? The, the, the divinity within and without has had a great deal to do with human beings having a natural awe, being moved by the beauty of this world we live in until we create slums and the people that never see the beauty that exists compared to those of us who are privileged to go out and, and go into the mountains and see the stars and see and feel that this universe is glorious. I mean, that was my experience when I was a Girl Scout to, to, to shift from inner to outer, to shift from looking at the stars at night and, and, you know, looking for a shooting star or something like that. And, and thinking it was really amazing because I lived in Los Angeles and I was up in the mountains where I never, I, in LA, I never saw the stars, but up in the mountains, they were just amazing. And then one, one about the third year and, and up at Girl Scout camp, I did a shift in, 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 that can happen in between looking really carefully at the stars because I was looking for a shooting star because I could make a wish on it if I saw one. And somehow, I was no longer outside of the universe looking at the stars. It and I became one in some mysterious way that is a human ability. This whole mysticism business is something that we come into the world with the ability to have. And when we have it, we are changed by it. Mm -hmm. We are in awe of this beautiful world we live in and the universe that we live in. And we start to value things much, much more. So I couldn't agree more than how when we see the moon and are, are, are moved by it or see the beauty of the earth and are moved by it, how it can affect us. But the kids in the world have to have the opportunity to have those experiences. Jean, thank you very much. This has been a deeply meaningful early afternoon, late afternoon, early evening. So Everything that we have done today will be online. We'll have it at mythosophia.net and we'll have it online at the Mythology Channel. Um, I thank everyone deeply and Jean, thank you very much. This has been yes. a very, very meaningful afternoon. So yeah. with that, thank you very much. Thank you, Jean. Thank you very much. And you started yes. us out with with a bowl, I'd like to end us with the same sound. <laughs>